Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the EP Growth Podcast. I'm your host today, Chris, the clinic manager here at Hunter Rehab. And today we've got a special guest, Nadai Borges. How are you, mate? Good. Thanks, Chris. How are you, mate? Good to, uh, good to be here. Thanks for having me on board. No, mate. Thanks for, for joining us. I'm going well. So for those of you that don't know, Nadai, Senior Lecturer and Program Authority for Exercise Science at University of New South Wales. That's, uh, that sounds exciting. Very involved, mate. So that's, uh, for the listeners, can you, can you break that down a little bit? What's does that mean? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Chris. Good question. Um, I guess it's taken me a few years to get to where I am in, in terms of my position. Um, obviously, as as you'd expect, um, and as most people, I kind of started as, as a PT, you know, working in, in personal training while I was doing my undergraduate exercise and sports science degree, um, moved through the whole career progression, ended up in academia, and happy to touch base about kind of what that process was like in more detail. But um, yeah, at the moment, running the exercise science program here at UNSW, um, it's 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 a pretty cool job. Like it's a bit of a split between research, teaching, um, and at the moment we're really focused on launching a whole bunch of new programs. So we're we're a brand new school here at UNSW, launching. We launched four new programs this year, which has been a, a big effort. Um, two really cool new, I guess, XI XVIS programs too. Um, both of them articulated bachelor master programs. Uh, one of them is a bachelor of exercise science with the master of EP, which is a 4.4 year degree. And we've bitten the bullet and we've gone for a big exercise science, exercise physiology and physiotherapy combined degree. Um, wow. All accreditations in five years, um, really accelerated program, um, but like really great interest so far. And we're really um, excited to see how that goes. I'm, I'm hoping that we're really, you know, break down some barriers and, and and provide and produce some really great practitioners out there with, with both skill sets. So um really happy to see how, how that goes. Yeah. Right. So just to be clear, it's going to be a sports science EP physio combined degree. Yeah, exactly. So there's a, it's an undergraduate in exercise science um, with the masters of phys, uh, physiotherapy and exercise physiology. So five years in total, um, completely integrated degree and uh hopefully the students will the students should walk out with all three accreditations um which will be you know put them in a, in a pretty good position i think to be kind of in, in employable um upon graduation and, and like i said i think for me it's, it's more focusing on on the skill sets right being able to um, have those really advanced diagnostic skills while still being able to like forecast and, and prescribe exercise in the long term for kind of long-term, um, you know, return to work, return to play or whatever, whatever the situation might be. Yeah. That sounds incredible. I mean, I remember when I was going through it and there was always that, that question, like, am I going to go down the sports science route and try to work with professional teams? Will I go clinical and try and do the, the rehab side of things? Will yeah. I be hospital or private clinic? And, or, or obviously you can go down the physio route and now you're sort of covering a lot of bases there. I think from um, the private clinic, the business sort of owner, owner management perspective, that's going to create a lot of attractive options. It's uh, incredible, mate. No doubt you've been uh, busy, busy, busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been it's been a lot of work, but um, you know, things are like I said. We 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 just launched them this year, so first year intake this year. I guess it'll take us five years to see kind of what the the end outcome is in terms of um the graduating cohorts. But yeah, we're we're really happy, and um, you know, we're we're always looking to to get as um as much industry uh, input into our programs like you know obviously we, we've had a pretty good relationship i think over the last couple of years which really highlights you know how how dedicated i think universities are now to to engage with industry partners and make sure that you know as students progress they're they're as ready as they can be um once they graduate and they've had you know exposure to some really great um opportunities and you know when they graduate they can kind of hit the ground running as best they can in terms of their their knowledge and their skill sets yeah, certainly we value that working close with the uni. So uh, the end product is, you know, a professional that's ready to go. There's, there's not as big a gap. So that's awesome. But hey, we're already kind of diverging a little bit. We're getting, getting stuck into some uh, some interesting stuff, with, which I, I'm actually really excited about. I love that. But mate, tell us a little bit about uh, when you first started. So you were into the S&C stuff, EP, uh, and then you started to, to head back more towards research. Why was that? How did that come about? Yeah, it's it's a funny journey. Um, I guess like when I finished my Bachelor of Exercise Science back in 2008, I think it was, um, you know, I, I was kind of done with the university system. I, I had that that attitude of like, oh, 
you know, it was, it was first generation exercise science programs, very science heavy, not very pragmatic, not very, you know, applied. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of walked away going, oh, you know, I'm, I'm done with the uni system. I want to make an impact in industry. Um, and I did. And, you know, I went through and I got my EP accreditation. Um, I got my level two ASCA accreditation relatively early and I was working um, as an EP kind of under the work cover scheme at the time, um, which is, you know, the, the Cirrus scheme. Uh, and at the same time, I was doing some some work with some 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 sports teams, just some S and C work, uh, and and I was having a great time. And I guess I got to a point where I realized that maybe the the sporting industry was it's it's really tough to crack. And I think there's a lot clearer pathways now than there were ten years ago, particularly through universities with um, like honors and and PhD pathways embedded in in high performance teams. So that, that's a lot easier to, to do nowadays. But um, I think, you know, back when I was figuring out my path, um, I think I realized that the, the sporting side of things was probably, um, you know, a passion project. But for me to pay the bills, um, I really started focusing on the, the EP and the clinical side. Um, and there was lots of opportunities. And there still are, I think, like the EP, um, you know, clinical EP area ha definitely has, it, it's it's a a profession in growth um, and I think there's lots of demand so if you are you know listening to this and you're studying and you're wondering about your career prospects I definitely think you know EP is, is an area of growth so it's, it's actually a pretty good time to be graduating um, but yeah I started focusing on on um, you know working in in, in work cover uh, return to work um, or return at work plans I think they're called now I'm a little bit out of date out of touch um, and I got to a point, I guess, where I I had to make a decision. And I guess my decisions were do do I do I start a business, right? Do I start a business and do I I I I work down that path or do I go back and and maybe do some research? Like I always love science, particularly through high school. I, I love science and I love sport. Um, and I guess my university experience didn't really foster that at the time, but uh, I still had that desire, you know, within me to to go back and maybe do something a bit more scientific. And um, at the time I was just perusing through the ESSA website and I noticed that there was um, an opportunity up in Queensland to do a PhD. And I had just gotten back from traveling for a year and I was like still adventurous. And I just yeah. kind of jumped at the opportunity without thinking or, or, or you know, doing too much um, due diligence on, on, on stuff like that. And before I knew it, I was living in, in Rockhampton for three years in central Queensland. So as, as a Sydney sider, it was it was a, a, a bit of a cultural change for me, but um, you know the best experiences always are. Hmm. Um, so yeah, then I jumped into a a PhD, which is kind of the 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 first step of becoming an academic. You generally go on to um, a, a higher research degree, um, such as a master's by research or PhD, and then um, once I completed that, I. I ended up um, getting a job at the University of Newcastle. And I was at the University of Newcastle for, for six years as an academic. Um, we did some really great stuff there. And we actually launched a, a Master of Clinical Exercise Physiology program in 2021, I think it was. And um, obviously, that's where, you know, you and I met and, and um, you know, within our our efforts and our, our initiatives to, to get as many industry partners on board through the development of that program. Um, you know, we, we forged a really great relationship with Hunter Rehab and Health um, and, and we're really happy how that's gone. And yeah. then I guess, yeah, a year ago, I moved to Sydney and, and I, I got a job at UNSW. So Sydney is my home. So there was, you know, obviously, uh, I really loved, um, you know, the, the Hunter New England, Central Coast region, but uh, Sydney is home for me. It's where my friends and family are. So it was a, a whole 10 year journey, I think, you know, from leaving to go to Rockhampton and, and coming back and traveling overseas and all these different things. So uh, yeah, I'm glad to be home and, and, you know, continuing to, I guess, do some really fun stuff here, here in Sydney. It's been a whirlwind, mate, just traveling around the place, creating awareness of EP, setting up programs, just it's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's fun. It's a funny story. Is it like when you finish a, like a sports science degree or something like that, it's, it's, um, it's great because there's so many options to you, but that's also the scariest thing. It's not like, this is what I do. It's like, you could go and do a lot of things. You're like, yes, but which one? And that's sort of a little bit daunting. And uh, to hear you sort of talking about going back to do some research, it's <laughs> had uh, family members. Oh, what do you reckon? You might, you might go back and do a PhD. And I was like, Oh, I don't think I can do referencing anymore. I can't have that anymore. But um, yeah, never really followed down the, the pathway I went down, but 
what was the um the phd on so the the phd was on recovery rates and age uh so you know that old adage of like you know as you get older things become harder it takes you longer to recover um we we had a a supervisor at the time who was really interested in in, in masters athletes so older athletes yep. um so we were kind of asking those types of questions around like you know how does a must how does a you know lifelong athletic lifestyle uh impact you know your your potential deterioration in physical capacities and your ability to recover after exercise um so yeah my my specific project was looking at recovery rates um following you know high intensity work well, high intensity work and also like a high intensity um continuous exercise bout so like you know representative training sessions that a, a cyclist might do you know like a race pace uh, kind of 40 minute to one hour session versus like a, a high intensity interval sessions with like you know a 30 second bout and a bit of recovery um it was really fun it was really good like we we, we found some cool stuff as as a group and like i think that that area has progressed quite well um really interesting things around so you know there may be a delay in recovery in these older athletes um if muscle damage is there you know so if you're doing an exercise bout where you incite muscle damage so something with a lot of maybe eccentric uh, muscle contractions uh there tends to be a delay in physical recovery so your ability to you know to to get on the bike again and, and do a, a max effort um and there isn't a real clear link to why at the moment we're thinking it might be due to um, you know, changes in the ability of older athletes to to resynthesize muscle protein from a, from a given kind of meal. Um, so if there's muscle damage, there does seem to be an impact, um, even if you are like highly trained as as, as an older um, athlete. But um, if you don't have muscle damage, there seems to be this this relationship where there isn't really any clear evidence about a delay in physical recovery, but there seems to be a perceptual relationship where people feel like older athletes feel like it's taking them longer to recover um but like you know the physical evidence isn't there so whether or not that's impacting their quality and the quantity of the subsequent training is is kind of like you know where where that area is now you know so um it was really fun to to be to be part of that and obviously that's kind of um it started a real interest in me um, within like, you know, exercise and aging, um, just seeing these masters athletes and what they can achieve. Like some of the things they're doing is, is just wild. Um, like, you know, you've got, you know, athletes over a hundred years of age, still competing, doing long jump. Um, you know, it's just, it's just crazy what they can do. And it really shows you that, Hey, you know, if you, if you maintain, you know, next, uh, a lifestyle and you, and you do the right types of exercise, you really can, you know, there is deterioration over time. It's inevitable, but what you can achieve and the quality of life you can maintain um, by doing the right things is is actually really, really kind of inspiring. Yeah, awesome. I think you're kind of a little bit ahead of it, obviously, but I've, I've read recently um, Dr. Peter Atiyah's book, Outlive, and he covers a lot of these concepts as well about aging and maintaining um, not just your health, but your, your quality, quality of life as you age and touches on some of those things like, um, yes, there is like a sort of a standard like the, the daily requirements for nutrition, but how that might also change as you age given yeah. to utilize it and things like that. It's really um, moving research, I suppose, is something for us all to to um, stay across because of the implications when working with those populations. But um, I guess going from the practical sort of prescription side of things, working with these clients once one and then doing the research that side of things what's sort of the major crossover in skills there what would be the major skills that you're using on a day-to-day in a research role mm, yeah that's a great question and i think there's there's historically been a bit of a disconnect i think with what's happening at the coal face in industry and and kind of what, what's happening um you know in, in the research areas because basically you know research is, is historically meant to be something really really controlled right where you effectively manipulate one variable and you try to get a really clear response um and, you know, like at the cold face, things are moving so quickly that, you know, it takes research five years to, to answer a relatively simple question, whereas, uh, well, not a simple question, but, a, a, you know, a very specific question where, you know, in industry, things are moving so quickly. But what what I've kind of, um, I guess what I've come to in my research career is is a point where I, I'm really impacted by, my research questions are really impacted by my industry experience that I had as I was going through as a clinician. Uh, and all of the research I try to do now is embedded or directly co- co-designed with industry partners uh, in a way to, to make sure that whatever research I'm doing, um, 
one translates into some real world impact, but also has impact directly when we're collecting that data. Um, so at the moment we're doing, as, as you as you know, like you, you you're directly involved with this project, but a project like Engage, where the research question is is very much like we're looking to see if there are any cost. How, how can we implement and develop cost effective models of healthcare? Um, by by looking at different ways to to bring in multi multi way partnerships and, and student practitioners and integrate them into the healthcare system and really have like a direct impact. So like making sure that when we're collecting the data, we're engaging with community or with the community already, developing and delivering a service. Um, and at the same time, we're collecting data around that just so we can, you know, in an iterative sense, keep making small changes to the program um, and making sure that it's meeting the needs while still developing an evidence base around it, which is quite a, a different way to, you know, historically a, a program like that looking to you know deliver an exercise program for older adults would be here's the program it's a 12-week program come into the uni do it we'll do measures pre-post uh and that and that's it um so i think yeah in terms of to answer your question in, in a bit of a roundabout way um one of the key things i think i learned as a practitioner was what what's important i guess at the cold face um and and really being able to collaborate now with industry partners is is a huge skill set for me as a researcher. Um, really making sure that I I can you know chat with with clin clinical EPs, with sports scientists and, and SNC coaches at, at sports clubs. All of these things open a lot of opportunities for us, and make sure that any research that we do is is grounded in reality, right? Or well, not yeah. so much grounded in reality, but will have you know a, a, an impact. Um, like a, yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Mate. It almost sounds like it's um, from what you're saying there is, yeah, the crossover skill is just the experience in general from having been there and, and done it before and seeing how things work on a day to day. Like what's that you kind of touched on? What is the real world? Being able to then apply that in your research, that's sort of it's almost an advantage to have been a practitioner first and then come and do the research. One hundred percent. And it's not even just how does it work; it's what what doesn't work, right? Um, like you know, when we're delivering our service what are the pinch points, right? What are the friction points? Um, and then like research really gives you an opportunity to to explore those friction points um, and try to come up with innovative solutions that can then hopefully be applied back into practice. So definitely having that experience gives you perspective and then also gives you an opportunity to reflect on on where you think improvements could be made. And that's kind of where, you know, you can you can do that in a, in a bit of a more formal sense from a, from a research pathway. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing you touched on there was your experience and, and skills in being able to network and communicate with other people, building relationships. That's something that we really push on, on young students or young MPs, I should say now, uh, the importance of it, you know, don't just stay in your lane as a, an EP and just, you know, stay in your own practice and, and don't talk to anyone. You need to sort of get other perspectives, other opinions and find out how things work, include them in your practice. So it's only going to make you better. And then, yeah, as you've experienced, in uh in your other journeys whatever it might be in the future you take it with you but i mean let's go back to it you just touched on engage so do you mm -hmm. want to sort of elaborate a bit more on, on what that is and maybe even some of the findings you've been uh getting so far with the program yeah for sure i mean i can talk about engage all day so i'll try to keep it relatively <laughs> brief um so engage is a, a program that we really developed when we were looking to launch the master of exercise physiology at um or clinical ex phys at, at the university of newcastle uh, and at the same time obviously the, the royal commission into aged care was ha happening and there's a lot of focus on on um you know the issues and, and the way that older adults were not really getting the support that that they need um from 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 the healthcare system in general um so we're really looking to to create uh, a bit of impact there and, and it was a multi-way a multi you know th there was benefits from from multiple perspectives around what we were trying to do we we're really trying to make sure that the, the university and the students were provided really authentic opportunities you know through their placements to make sure that they they could have hands-on experience um, and at the same time we were looking to to grow relationships with our industry partners such as hunter rehab and health um, and make sure that whatever we we set up wasn't just the university asking businesses to take on students. Um, it was almost like a co-design program where the businesses also get a benefit and there's a framework around it. So the students are are trained before they start. And, and obviously there's a, there's a bit of revenue coming back through to the business. So it's not just, um, 
you know, us just throwing students at, at, at businesses and saying, Hey, can you, can you help teach our students for nothing? Um, and at the same time, obviously we wanted to have a direct kind of community impact. Um, and what we ended up creating were, were two programs as engage community and engage um, RACF or residential aged care. Um, and, and they're, they're both aimed at older adults over 65 uh, and they're both, um, programs that are facilitated by an accredited exercise physiologist, but they have student practitioners embedded with them. So um, at any point, what we're trying to do here is just increase the ability um, of, of the programs to, well, we're trying to increase the contact time, right? If we put more practitioners into the program, each individual participant gets, gets more contact time. Um, and both programs were developed off, you know, the current MBS um, or the Medicare benefit schedule structures um, so we were really cognizant of um, again trying to create programs that at, at, at some point hopefully down in the future we've developed these programs in a way that we can just hand them over to to the end users to the community or to government agencies who may want to run it um, so specifically what I mean there is um, you know with the the RSCF project um, you know we looked at the MBS funding and you know you know just as well as I do you know much better than I do that you know the, the amount of money you get from a, a Medicare you know a CDM or a chronic disease management um, Medicare session is about 50 60 55 dollars so as an EP to make that cost viable you're looking at three per hour right a 20 minute session realistically mm. um, so we took that kind of model and we're like okay how, how can we value add to this model um and make sure that we're still kind of working within the framework that is that is laid out here by the kind of medi the MBS. Um, and we just ended up, you know, pretty simple. It sounds simple now, but, you know, a 20 minute session with an AEP and then a subsequent 40 minute session with a student practitioner. And basically we have, you know, three residents rolling through each hour um, and then they get a supplemental 40 minute session each with, with a student practitioner. So effectively we still have that Medicare model, um, but we've just added, uh, you know, a, an additional 40 minutes of contact time with each of the residents um, through through adding the student practitioners into that model. Um, the community model, which Hunter Rehab and Health are directly involved in, is a, is a group telehealth um, initiative, which is, uh, again, we, we did the, the same thing. You know, we were just looking at how can we increase the contact time um, with each of our participants by adding student practitioners into the fold. Um, and a lot of this was actually... Uh, inspired through a lot of the teaching modifications we had to make through COVID going online um, using Zoom and, and using breakout rooms specifically in Zoom. So, it was uh, wasn't it? All very cutting edge. <laughs> it, it, it all came together and, you know, the impact was was huge. But, um, yeah, so effectively, you know, we, we just make sure that, you know, we have small group. We can recruit 25 people into a group class, do it all on Zoom, but, you know, having the student practitioners there and having the ability to use breakout rooms means that although we have, you know, 30 people on a single Zoom call, um, you know, we can break them up into small groups. So we still have like a one to five practitioner to participant ratio and everyone still gets a very individualized um, program and they don't feel like they're lost on the call. So, uh, yeah, and, and the results have been great, um, really, really promising. So, we you know, we've, we've seen, you know, improvements in social, mental and physical health in all of our participants. Um, we also track the students' development. So we've seen improvements in student um, self-reported uh, work, self-efficacy, work readiness, skill perception. So again, like, you know, the, the programs are having that community benefit where we're directly, you know, providing hours or, or you know, we're delivering service directly into the community. And we hope that we've like developed these programs in a way that they can be integrated into businesses like like yours and, and like the aged care facilities. So we don't really create an impost on the business, but we're trying to actively value add to, you know, the business practices while still having all these other benefits and, you know, producing a little bit of research on the side. Yeah. Look, it's those listening. It, it's fantastic. The, the engage programs on, on multiple fronts. So having been a part of it and then seeing the outcomes for the participants. So as you touched on there, Nadai, the, the social engagement sides of things. So working with the elderly populations who might be stuck at home, particularly in COVID is what you spoke about. So logistics, helping them to understand Zoom, first of all. But once we got through that, uh, 
the what the participants got out of it from meeting regularly in their little groups as you discussed they, they were forming friendships they were they were getting excited to to jump onto the next zoom because the the activities that were left and their their will, willingness to sort of get involved in it so it's awesome to hear that you've got some some outcomes already uh, looking promising yeah. on the regard but um also the physical sides of things because they had that attachment and that that sort of group dynamic they were more willing to engage in the pro- in the in the physical sides of things so yeah. It was awesome to see that, but then uh, the other side of things. So on a student placement, it can be difficult, like as a host. So there's so many different things to consider from the host perspective that you want to provide the best experience you can for the student, but there are other factors, right? Whereas this placement, the engaged placement is kind of built around the student, like the student is running it and the EP here just sort of, okay, like, what would you like to do? Let me, I can help you, but you're running it. And so that what you touched on there, the self-efficacy of the EPs or the, the student EPs, went through the roof because they had to do it. Like you were in charge, it's your idea. And the confidence I'm sure they've taken out of, out of it at the end was, was amazing. So yeah, mate, like it's a, I'm excited to be a part of the program. I think it's fantastic. So credit to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chris. And like the success of the program really has come down to the partnerships that we set up early on. And, you know, without the support of Hunter Rehab and Health, particularly for that community program, like it wouldn't be as successful without um you know that the help and the resources that you guys have provided to that too so um it's it's a team effort um, <laughs> this is all very i guess lovely. one thing i i just wanted to quickly add that i think your listeners might be interested in is you know reflecting again on how my time as a clinician has impacted my research like the the whole idea of engaged community is it's in the the name is we we wanted to provide or we wanted to develop a program that creates a community because we know and this is something i learned really early on is that you know we can make the best exercise program um, possible, right? But if we don't create a community around it and we don't foster adherence through creating that community, they're not going to do it. And then that best exercise program ever created is, is kind of pointless. Um, when I was working in Rockhampton, we, we, I was working at a clinic and we had a, there was a program there running at, at Vector Health Clinic. Uh, Glenn, if you're listening, uh, kudos to you. It was called Stronger, Stronger for Longer. And um, the, it was a games ba- games based exercise program for older adults, and um, it was going well. But then all of a sudden, the older participants started bringing in little cakes, and they started having a morning tea, you know, after the class. And then um, the morning tea ended up taking over, you know, the whole morning tea area of the, of the clinic. And then all of a sudden, the morning tea became more popular than the exercise class, and people were showing up for the morning tea and just doing the exercise class because it was attached to the morning tea. And for me, as a practitioner, it was a really early i guess um lesson around when we're creating exercise programs that we we can't just focus on the exercise we have to look at it from a holistic manner and really look to create social aspects where we can look to you know create a community around it and that's what's going to bring people back consistently um and and really drive those health outcomes that we're looking for so uh, again just an instance of where my early clinician work has really impacted the research that I'm doing now. And and I think it's been one of the reasons why engaged community is so successful is because we focus so heavily on that social aspect. Um and and that's what really brings people back, I think. Yeah, that's an awesome insight, Matt. I think you have the best program in the world, the best exercises there, all put together, perfect. But if the person has no attachment to it, if they don't want to do it, well it's not worth the paper it's written on. Yeah. So uh, I think Matt like What's what's the ultimate goal of the research for you? Like, where is it all sort of heading? You know? Oh, big one. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question. So uh, we've effectively gone through a feasibility pilot phase at the moment is what I would call it, right? Like, just can we actually get this off the ground? Can we set up the relationships? Is this a model that, that can work and can provide impact? And I think we've shown that it can um, and it does. I guess for us, the next stage is looking to to grow the project, particularly the Engage project, to a point where um, it can be handed over to the end users, right? So what that means is, 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 I guess, over the next phase of the project, looking to grow the project, maybe, maybe across all of New South Wales uh, and through like economies of scale, finding out where, where our sweet spot is in terms of how many programs we need to develop to to make it really cost viable um right because the more people we get in potentially the 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 cheaper each class becomes um and we're looking at i guess like funding models or or co-contribution funding models to see if there's 
opportunities for us to, to, to minimize the costings. But effectively, what we want to do is move this from a research project to a household name, right? In terms of like, here's a program, the Engage program, you know, it, 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 it's delivered all across New South Wales, all across the country. Um, if you want to enroll, there's a website, you just go on. It, it, it runs independently, essentially, from, from a university and, and, and a research perspective. It's just an evidence-based program. Um, so that, that, that's the end goal. Uh, in terms of getting there, we still have quite a bit of work to do. Um, like I mentioned, we need to scale and grow the program and just make sure that whatever we end up handing over to, to the community away from the university system is something that's that's cost effective and that can work. Because um, I think there are a lot of university initiatives that get to a point where they've shown benefit, they try to hand it over to the community, but you know, once you take away the university resources, the, the program can't run anymore. So we're really looking to grow the program to a point where it can run independently and then we can hand it over to the community and they can just, you know, go on as as um and, and you know continue to have impact. And that that's that's the end goal for us, right? Just to create something that can translate uh, into real community benefits and, and can, you know, um, be sustainable in the long term. Nice, man. I think that's a, a great goal to have, right? It's, yeah, I think that's why we all sort of get into this kind of field is to have lasting real results for, for people in the community. But hey, the final question I'll, I'll put to you here, we try to ask it for, for all the guests, but to, yeah. you know, in your opinion, given your experiences, uh, what makes the best EP or, or SNC for you? So in how you would define the best? That's a great question. Um, and I'm sure you've gotten quite a varied response, but for me, I think it's someone who who listens and someone who's personable uh, and someone who can engage people on on the individual level um, as 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 an individual practitioner. Um, obviously, you need to have the experience, you need to have the the knowledge behind creating those programs. but like like we said before, I think you know a lot of the battle or, or a lot of the job is actually, you know, social and psychological, getting people to buy in to what you're trying to sell. Um, and if, if you don't have that buy in, you don't have that ability, you can make the best programs in the world. But, you know, if no one's going to do them, what's the point? So for me, I think it, it's really about balancing those two, those two aspects, you know, making sure that you can provide, you know, evidence-based, really great programs that meet the individual needs of your client, but also being able to 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 get them to buy in and then having that ability to to socially sell your product and 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 yeah and and get them engaged it's interesting man we've had a few answers so far and you just said like i'm sure they've been varied there's actually you know real thread there i think you you've nailed it yeah. again mate. so excellent stuff before we wrap it up any last thoughts anything else we should cover uh no no it's been it's been great to be on thanks chris um again really great that I think you're doing this podcast again it's another another instance where you know hunter rehab and health are really showing that they are community leaders and and really looking to to be leaders within our profession too and and advocate for for what EPs are doing who we are what our services are so um thanks so much for having me on board it's a privilege to be here and I hope you guys keep doing all the good stuff that you're doing thanks man I appreciate it. we're certainly doing our best out there but before we wrap it up where can people find you if they want to reach out after today's podcast well, that's a, I didn't think about that. Um, so yeah, I guess on the UNSW website, you could look me up just Natai, N-A-T-T-A-I, Borges, B-O-R-G-E-S. Um, you can reach me via email, just natai.borges at unsw.edu.au. Uh, I have a Twitter account that I don't really go on too much. So probably the best way to go is, is just through email. So uh, yeah, jump on the UNSW um uh website and you can find my profile there it's also i think i'm still on the university of newcastle website too so either either university if you look me up um you can find my contact details beautiful all right i think we'll wrap it up there that'll do us for today thanks everyone for for listening in uh, and we'll catch you next time we do it all again bye for now